before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. And then came the sort of idea of listening as a conceptual practice, which became like just something I wrote in my notebook and it just stayed with me as a thing. So taking all the conceptual roots and methodologies that I learned and thinking about how it applies to music, but then opening up. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Right now, at the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, There's an exhibition of paintings on view that might remind you of the post-war abstractions of painters like Barnett Newman and Agnes Martin, who made a virtue of empty space and muted palettes. The difference is, however, that the paintings at the Guggenheim are not just meant to be looked at and admired. No, they are meant to be listened to. That's because the artist Jenny C. Jones makes art that is as oral as it is visual, building her compositions directly onto acoustic panels, her signature material, in order to shape the sound of the rooms in which they are installed. For Jones, this barely perceptible effect is a way of paying deep homage to the black architects of mid-century avant-garde music, such as free jazz pioneers who turned strategic silence into a statement. Listening, Jones has said, is a conceptual practice all on its own. On the occasion of the exhibition, which is called Dynamics, and acts as a mid-career survey of the artist's unique body of work, Artnet News' Taylor Defoe sat down with Jenny C. Jones at her studio in Hudson, New York, where they talked about embracing gesture, John Coltrane, and the artist's own upstream path to recognition. Hi, Jenny. Thank you for being on The Art Angle. How are you? I'm well. <laughs> I'm just going to jump right in. So you often begin your artist talks by showing a photo of John Coltrane at the Guggenheim. Given that your current exhibition at the Guggenheim is the reason we're speaking today, I thought that might be a good place for us to start. What does that photo mean to you and to your practice? I would say it's like retroactively. I started my talks with that photograph in like 2005-ish, so a long time. And I feel like I'm kind of moving on from that, but it's a really beautiful cyclical moth story to say that I sort of manifested an exhibition in the very space that I was kind of pointing to institutional critique. So what interested me about that photograph was his gaze staring directly at the viewer, and then you glance down and he's pointing at his instrument case in this very assertive way, as if to say, like, this is my form of art. This is my form of modernism. I am inside the space that excludes the kind of modernism and the kind of expression that he had and the early constructs of post-war music had in tandem with the ship from Paris to New York and that sort of whole pedagogy. What was the original context of that photo? Do you know? He was a visitor. Lauren Hinkson, the curator of the exhibition, when we first were talking, sent me other photographs because she knew the exhibition. And I think it's 1953. She knows who took the photograph, but it had nothing to do with the work that was up or for an album cover or anything like that. So it's interesting that, you know, who's haunting the institution, who's absorbing one type of a creative process and then taking that back and back and forth. So that kind of interchange between art and music and inclusion and exclusion and narratives around modernism. So that's the scene you're setting for your artist talks? I think that that was, and I keep saying past tense because I feel like there's a very hardcore specific origin story that's like a very specific thesis to sort of ask the question, where am I in this narrative? Someone who's incredibly brainwashed in the deep end of art school and a ton of art history from teenage years to look for myself in these narratives, but also to look for ways to push against the canon as well. So critique it and engage with it at the same time, sort of like that love-hate relationship with paint. You can use it as a material or you can get lost and the flow of all the isms throughout art history and what painting meant. You mentioned your background. I've read that you grew up in a creative household. I think so. (laughs) It was a very 70s household. I mean, it was just like 
free to be you and me and no shoes running around. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we can say it for the record, but like my dad's smoking weed in the garage kind of situation awesome. and for good and bad, <laughs> good and bad free range parenting on occasion. Sure. But my mom was really the cornerstone of the creative energy of our house. She taught Montessori school very briefly. We had lots of literature and music and records in the house. We had a piano, which I quit. <laughs> then I wanted to play the violin, which I quit. <laughs> I always sort of, in a dramatic way, say that I, I wanted to just hide under the dining room table and make drawings instead. <laughs> But when no one was home, I would just make up crazy songs on the piano and just like, it's like the beginning of the private improvising studio practice <laughs> stuff. But in the piano bench, there was like all kinds of percussion tools that you had as a kid. So lots of encouragement to be creative. What kind of music were you exposed to early on? Definitely a big range. So folk music, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Richie Havens, Cat Stevens, Doobie Brothers, like that's early... And then my mom had an extensive interest in jazz and also South American music and samba. I think that was just sort of like her 50s, 60s. Then my brothers were like, one was like hardcore Rolling Stones rock and roll, and the other one was like hardcore P-Funk Ohio Players. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just like that. But by the time I was in high school, I, you know, I had processed all of that. And so I loved everything from Astrid Gilberto to like, crass and black flag and then i was goth for a while and the depression with the <laughs> big flock of seagulls bangs and cocteau twins and joy division yes. and marcy and just like ooh, that's like so got, puberty <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of those those phases of that air system yeah um, we should also mention that you grew up in, in Cincinnati. Right, in the, burbs. in the burbs. So like 45 minutes outside of Cincinnati in a little township called Wyoming. As a kid, you said you were experimenting with what was around you, making wacky, improvisatory musical pieces. When did you start to make visual art? Oh, I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, maybe it's just the last two years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a blessing and a curse. I was one of those kids that if you asked me when I was seven what I wanted to be, I said artist. And I was lucky enough to also go to a great school system. It was like kind of the move to the right side of the tracks, just enough to go to the better school district. It was well worth it and incredible, but also like, you know, whatever, isolating and strange, not a lot of diversity. So by high school, I was taking AP art classes. I recently found a paper that I wrote from an English class. The prompt was just to write compare and contrast. And I think I was 15 and I wrote about Favism and Cubism, <laughs> basically straight from an encyclopedia. But to think that I was 15 in Ohio trying to figure out these two massive <laughs> ways of seeing and making work. By right. the way. Were you making paintings then? Drawings? I was making drawings, paintings. I always worked with diptychs and triptychs. And it's funny because I would think that's the only thing that's like gone through all of my work from teenage to now is just working in a series. Still life drawing, sad goth pencil drawings of trees out of my window. Without knowing who Diane Arbus was, I made a graphite image of one of her photographs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I also had a Basquiat locket that I would wear. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. Then came undergrad at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, what were you making there? SCIC was the most incredible experience yeah. and it remains just like the most incredible education. And even the time period that I was there, I think was pivotal in the culture wars and AIDS crisis and the Persian Gulf War, censorship, New Gingrich. I mean, there was this hotbed of activity, but the Art Institute is structured so that you have to take 2D, 3D and 4D yeah. when you arrive and arriving from Ohio, like you arrive with all the single weirdos from all the high schools yeah. and they're in one building together like oh. all the kids who went through the, their own goth phases exactly yeah. and so 2d 3d and 4d i mean incredible because i arrived as a painter and then i'm taking body movement classes and learning about sculptural materials and making holograms and they have a performance art 
department. I think they're still one of the only schools that has a performance art department. And the technology department is crazy. So 4D was also film video, audio equipment you could you could check out and play with. But by the time you graduate, you're supposed to declare your major. And everyone ends up being so interdisciplinary by the time they leave that you're like, okay, I guess I'm still a painter. Yeah. <laughs> and so our joke was everyone should have a t-shirt that says, I started as a painter. Circling back to painting the last like 10 years has been through that critical lens, through the lens of all these other conceptual ways of thinking and all these other kind of interdisciplinary constructs. Yeah. And then paint becomes a material, a conceptual material. And walking through the museum to get to class. At that point, there weren't all these outbuildings. It was really still a museum school. So yeah. you might meet in front of Van Gogh with your class. Yeah. And you had to walk through different sections of the museum that made it all the more magical. Yeah. You mentioned being at SAIC during the height of the culture wars and at a time when identity politics had started to infiltrate art in a significant way. Throughout your career, it seems you've often operated at odds with the prevailing trends of the day, embracing abstraction or minimalism, say, when portraiture was popular or neo-expressionism was preferred by the market. Were you engaging with the ideas at the center of the culture wars, or were you going against the grain even then? It's a complicated linear history that we're all sort of subjected to as makers. And I think that everyone makes like work that when you're 20, you're just like, oh oh God, like it's under the bed. I don't want it's developmental work. It's work you're making to find your way. Yeah. And I definitely had like photo collage and rip from the headline moments and reading my first feminist discourses and and reading early bell hooks and Lucy Lepard's mixed blessings had a huge impact on yeah. me and all of us because it was like all the missing pages in Jansen's or Gardner's Art Through the Ages was right. dropped on us by Lucy Lepard and just kicked everything open. But I think the underpinning of going through that kind of literal translation of one's social political stance and through the rigor and important work that happened with multiculturalism as an ism is that I think who and what survived and had longevity or the conceptual artists, hmm. the artists that had that operated in this sort of nuanced way with the work, specifically thinking of like Glenn Ligon of Carrie Mae Weems. It was a lot of photo driven work, yeah. but then underneath that, there was a lot of strategies that I think that kind of brilliance of the conceptual work was what ended up sticking with me the hardest. Hmm. Kind of coming out and realizing that I was a conceptual artist, fumbling through like painting, and but paper is an object, so paper is like a sculpture. Yeah. And paint is an object that I'm using in this way that has little to do with writing about Matisse when I'm 15. But that was a time that really shaped me, but it also highlighted the stereotypes that can happen and the pigeonholing that can happen. And I think that's been the hardest thing in terms of finding my own voice and feeling confident in the vernacular and the geometry that I sort of have made for myself Yeah, is this sort of still this gravity about blackness and not being black enough without figuration or without a signifier. Yeah, And I think that that's unfortunately, that's what the market did to my head Yeah, because it's not popular (laughs) (laughs) for a collector to point at something and, and not be able to have it just immediately read that it was made by a woman or by a person of color or by a queer person. Like, if it's harder and the viewer has to work a little bit harder, maybe that's where my high school fuck you punk rock comes in because now I'm just like, who cares? Yeah. Work a little harder. Maybe there's a metaphor in being absorbed yeah. and using a sound absorber. I mean, there's richness in other ways. When I was talking to my friends, they're very, and it's like, God forbid we should talk about joy. Yeah. You know, how many silk screens or drawings can we have of lynchings yeah. and who's buying them and why do you want to live with it? Yeah. You can know that history, but not have it be inside of your studio space, inside of your psyche. We're going through another moment now where identity based art is hugely popular. Do you wonder if the market is teaching young artists the wrong lessons in the same way that it did to you? I was on a panel once, Dawood Bey was the moderator, and he brought up this concept of systems of reward, and that really stayed with me too. It's kind of a fiction to sort of create this one historic moment, but 
to think about the Harmon Foundation and the Harlem Renaissance it was a foundation that gave the first awards and artist grants to artists of color. It's sort of dictated he will get rewarded for telling your story. Maybe Norman Lewis would not have gotten. So there's this kind of another kind of origin story in terms of who's elevated. But I don't know. It's like it's really sticky and hard to make an us versus them. But I will say that I spoke to Alma Thomas's work 30 years ago. And like, it's weird. It's like Carmen Herrera. These women in particular, they get recognized when they're dead or like the art world loves an old lady willing into her show when she's finally at the Whitney. And it's just heartbreaking because Mavis Pusey is another one. Howardina Pendel. I mean, there's people that I think have been courageous and consistent. And I can only hope that just my kind of maybe foolish consistency <laughs> was encouraged because of them just staying true to who you are. You're not going to make any money. You're not popular. But my goal is not to be an architectural digest and have a Ferrari. It's to have a garden and make my work. <laughs> I mean, so far, so good. Yeah. I have to figure out the car. <laughs> For a long time now, your work has invited a relationship with music and sonics. Initially, you did so by incorporating the physical, often analog, stuff of music production and distribution. You used things like headphones and speakers, instrument cables, and cassette tapes as material. Uh, that's a different approach to the one you have now. Can you tell me about this period of your practice? I think that when I was looking at that early origin story in terms of where am I inside of this modernist history, that music and listening was such a huge part of when I was stuck, like when I moved to New York, I just felt stuck and I didn't have a studio. So I had many years where I was making lots of works on paper, but I found that I was spending an enormous amount of time curating what I was gonna listen to before I started working. And then that became like, well, this is kind of, <laughs> this is kind of the work, yeah. like cataloging and musicology. And like, this is pre making a playlist. It was kind of a live performance practice of getting your music together yeah. and then ending up just sitting and listening and still being stuck in a way and then making drawings of speakers and making drawings that were coming out of that as a private listening practice. And then came the sort of idea of listening as a conceptual practice, which became like this is something I wrote in my notebook and it just stayed with me as a thing. So taking all the conceptual roots and methodologies that I learned and thinking about how it applies to music but then opening up, listening to really avant-garde or sonic, why isn't Ben Patterson really talked about in terms of Fluxus, Milford Graves, and like all of these kind of cats that operated on the periphery become as radical as the punk I listened to, but also this place of liberation that gave me sort of a fuck it, I don't have to worry about making a self-portrait. Yeah. This period of your output we're talking about is in the late 90s or early 2000s? I made my first sound piece in around 1999. I wasn't really getting into the physicality of music. I was still just making drawings. Right. And I had like always paper, always collage, yeah. which then leads to like thinking about graphic scores and seriality. Are there any works or ideas from that time that have stuck with you other than your general interest in musicality? I think there's methodologies with sound editing. I don't know hardware so much, and I really don't want to have to learn like Pro Tools or DJ editing master mixing equipment yeah. to make a drone piece. The first sound piece was You Make Me Feel Like a uh, Hundred Billy Holiday songs. And I just dumped and dumped and dumped mm -hmm. until I got to like 30, and they're just playing simultaneously just right before it yeah. falls apart. There's methodology that happened early on there that stayed. And then there's sort of two modes of geometric and non-geometric abstraction that happen, like wildness in the tape drawings, like pulling tapes out and stretching them and making these gestural pieces versus like looking at a pioneer stereo cabinet and really looking at it as geometry, looking at the crazy Walkman designs as like geometry. So there's still that. But now I think the gestural stuff is relegated to the scores and painting is starting to 
come more to the surface of the larger pieces. You began to incorporate acoustic paneling into your canvases around 11 years ago, doing so for the first time in your show at the kitchen in 2011, and has become a favorite strategy of yours since. Can you tell me about how you came to that material and what it unlocked for your practice? It came with a lot of early Googling and research, honestly, yeah. and really feeling um, pigeonholed and stumped with the scale of my work, a little bit I don't want to say snubbed, but certainly snubbed by galleries because scale, because people don't care about works on paper. <laughs> and they are actually the key for a lot of other larger parts of someone's practice. So I really wanted to problem solve. How can I begin to not just make illustration around listening and sound and speakers and residue, the physical residue, but how sound is operating in a physical space. And so I started sort of researching soundproofing, soundproofing materials. But then inside of that, really kind of looking at physics and architecture, and that has been like a cornerstone that weirdly led to like crazy things like the glass house and places that are like talking about modernism, but then you have to contend with architecture. And how do you do that? So I had had an exhibition at Sycama and in these gallery white box spaces, you can either push against the architecture or you can lean into it. And leaning into it always works. So it's going to echo. It's going to drift. So focus on something that's going to be enhanced by drifting and hitting a cement floor or a glass ceiling. But how can you start to nuance that? And so the acoustic panels, I got found them on eBay from this guy who was taking apart his recording studio. And those were the first black panels that I got. And I used them for that show at the kitchen. And I have to say the other reason the kitchen was so liberating was because it's a white box inside of a black box. I found my people in the sense that I was like, I kind of want to do this. You know, 10 mixing boards come out and they're just like, well, how do you want it to feel? And I'm like, I want it to feel this way. And then, you know, and Versus going into a gallery that's like, we're interested in sound, but you have to bring all of your own equipment, and we don't really know anything about it, and it can't be sold unless you're going to audition it, but then no one will buy a sound piece, so good luck. But the kitchen was just like, oh, click. It made so much sense, and, and that was an important show for me, for sure. It seems like that moment represented an important evolution in how you approach your work. The shift was really really going down the rabbit hole of acoustics and physics and architecture. And then inside of that, finding connection to music notation and making my own geometry from music notation. There's like a presence and absence thing for yeah. me that even without sound in the room, that the surfaces are kind of working and doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah. By absorbing sound, even if it's just like if these pieces were down, this room would physically sound more echoey. And in that sense, that's the shift of thinking of painting as an object versus painting as a window, as a picture making window. Paintings are objects. So even without an acoustic panel, theoretically, bodies, furniture, objects in a room affect the acoustics. So paintings, as things hanging on the wall, are already affecting how sound operates, so taking that to the next level. And I think that more and more, I really connect to the metaphor of absorption and diffusion, which are the two principles of acoustics. One is to deflect sound, and one is to absorb sound in echoey spaces. And that was the title of the kitchen show, Absorb, Diffuse. Right. Something that surprised me about your wall works in recent years, and it's an observation I had at the Guggenheim show as well, is how present your own hand is. In person, you notice gestural marks and imperfections that don't necessarily come through in pictures. It seems like this is an aspect of your work that you've embraced more with time. Yeah, and I think that's the push-pull struggle with painting yeah. and with gesture. The labor it takes to remove your mark is threefold. And now I've sort of intentionally do some work with a knife or a palette to give it a mark, and then the opacity builds from that. So there's this idea of subtone and underpainting, and then the sound dampening is also starting to connect to the opacity of paint, like how many layers and suppression and quiet is happening. 
With their curved and twisted walls, the Guggenheim's galleries really throw into stark contrast the rectilinearity of your work. That your canvases are as modular and flat as they are is interesting to me, especially given your interest in jazz and other forms of music that play with structure or allied structure altogether. Why are you drawn to that way of making? I think it's like as much as we try to escape the linear, it is. I mean, yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Not to get like that metaphysical about it, but even like, you know, the exhibition constant structure was coming from the music term, but really looking at something that's a constant flow and there's modulation and changes inside of that constant. And there is a constant, even when you reject reading music, there's still parameters Inside of improvisation, I would argue that there's still parameters. And I think that that's like an interesting space to push against, to occupy. It's confusing and it it's conflicting to want to talk about sort of modes of liberation and wild expression and then also containment at the same time. But the Guggenheim, I mean, that building is incredibly magical in the parameters that it presents. Yeah. And... It was completely cool to witness all of the team there that knows the math of the ramps because nothing is hung straight because you're never standing on a flat surface. Right. So everything is hung and it's organic. Each level is not the same math yeah. and each one of those bays is its own. It was fascinating. On the one hand, the Guggenheim with its rich ties to modernism seems like the perfect fit for you. On the other, it has such distinct acoustic and architectural properties. It sounds different than other museums, you know, and you can tell it right away. What was it like working in that space? Their one tech guy was amazing to work with. Because yeah. um, he's the one-man show there for, like, video, for everything. Really? And he's like a kind, kind wizard. There's no condescending you know like some tech guys you just feel like you're getting scolded like oh you know and especially when there's like the dudes that are like you know little lady you know you should have thought about it this way or what kind of gear do you have and yeah. i'm like ah. <laughs> but the first edited thing i brought is <laughs> was just vanished in the space and i was like you, i really had to step away because i music? almost cried yeah i was like are the speakers on like it was just like where is it? So he explained to me, you know, each of those bays has its own footprint. And then collectively, when the sound is going out, it just falls down. So then it was like, you know, talking to him, I was like, I know what I have to do. It was just like the show at Sycamore or effort shows where you just have to lean into what kind of sound is going to work in that space. And I bought in like several tones. And as soon as we hit the frequency, I had an analog tone in there, like a recording of a singing bowl mm -hmm. that I made. And as soon as that was gone and it was only the power of a digital output, it snapped. It just fit into the space in a way that we were shocked that you could go down three levels to the Kandinsky and still hear it. Yeah. But I wasn't initially really thinking about a drone piece, but it was pretty fast that I was like, oh, this needs to be ambient and it needs to just float. And also then reading the, their prompt and their premise of having the Oculus empty and putting the plants back in. Yeah. And we talked about that with Lauren Hinkson from the beginning. She was really advocating for this sense of respite, especially during COVID, to not hang any art on the sixth floor, have it just be this beautiful space. And Franklin Wright wanted plants in the building from the beginning. And slowly over time, the planters were covered up or taken out because conservationists were like, oh, yeah, like we want a moth to get out <laughs> or any cooties to affect the collection. <laughs> but bringing the plants back in and just seeing the architecture on the sixth floor, with letting that be the show, letting yeah. it come forward was magical. In the past, you've produced audio pieces based on specific environments. Was that the case for Oculus Tone, the sound installation that closes out your exhibition at the top of the Guggenheim spiral ramp? Since the Glass House piece, which was 2018, and a little bit before that, I started getting more interested in the idea of taking the texture from the work and filling the air with the texture, which leads to sort of thinking about drone and time in a different way. Like the Glass House was a gateway in the sense that I used the materials of 
the Philip Johnson building. It was a glass singing bowl and a metal singing bowl. Right. And you're sitting inside of a glass box made. <laughs> yeah. And it made sense to think about the structure of the Guggenheim and the roundness of the building to revisit that. But initially I was thinking about drum brush work, how a, when you just have a brush and it makes this beautiful kind of whisper and that was the texture, but it was lost in that space. So I needed to go back to something tonal because something that was just um, about surface wasn't going to work. So it ended up with three different tones. It kind of has three movements, which developed a little bit after the last piece in the exhibition is called Tritone, and it's an older piece. It's gray, felt, and black. And so initially it was one long drone with two sharp feedback cuts into it, which relates to sort of the sharpness of the diagonals in the visual work and also the hum of the glow on the edges. So there's this optics sonic relationship but then when tritone was there i said oh, i think that it needs to sort of be in three movements it's very subtle the tonal shifts but there's three tones that are layered and it's three minutes long which is like the quintessential length of a song there's still these little nerdy parameters at play i think it worked very well in the space yeah i mean i was terrified and the first two times that i sent files to peter i was like oh my god it's just going to be nothingness. It's not going to work. Yeah. I mean, one thing that was amazing about the exhibition at the Hirshhorn, I was between the Clifford Still and the Ellsworth Kelly rooms. Right. And I knew I was going to get sound bleed. I knew that I was going to poke my elbows into these two other and dudes. Yeah. 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 And I had written, I think, right after that, a piece in Art in America about Ellsworth Kelly. And sort of Siddhartha called him my secret boo. Yeah. <laughs> He said, okay, yeah. I'll switch it. <laughs> he's your secret poop. But I did write about how I just had this like hatred. I was just so furious with Kelly around the same time as Lucy Lepard because the Art Institute took down a whole, probably six or seven other artists because they purchased this whole suite right. of That's Kelly's right. and they're all in the, the atrium. Yeah. And we were furious, you know, not to mention that all these other artists were like now in storage. But I was secretly like staring at his black one and the yellow one. And I was so, I was angry at his liberty, Yeah, you know, that he was in a position to think about geometry and freedom in this other way that was like, yeah. yeah. Let's end with a fun question, Jenny. You mentioned that you started to engage with music in your visual art after the revelation that you were putting as much thought into what you were listening to while you were working as the work itself how have your listening habits changed over the years, and what are you listening to now? I was sort of anti-algorithm, and I'm also fascinated with it. It happens. There's magic moments that happen through algorithm where you're just like, no way did the sequence of these songs just happen. Well, my biggest confession is that I didn't have Spotify until I had to make the Dia playlist two years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because I was like, wait playlist like i was ready to like send them a dropbox yeah. of like songs <laughs> <The mixed tape. laughs> so, like, yeah. and they were just like oh it's all on spotify and i was like Ooh, <laughs> oh no so yeah pretty much 2020 i was not on pandora or spotify yeah but i do love that spotify can't figure me out at all <laughs> it's incredible yeah. it's just like what <laughs> it's just yeah i'm all over the place from like kendrick lamar to patsy klein like they're just like huh yeah and then like Lock of Seagulls comes in or some random, <laughs> it's like 70s folky stuff still. I love that still. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again for joining us on the show, Jenny. It was a real pleasure speaking with you. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manoli, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.